in terms of pathogens that would be relevant to like climate crisis, to wilding, there's, there's several things in, in the books, obviously. And I want to read a passage from Hummingbird Salamander, the, the latest novel, the kind of the poetic dream companion to the surreal dream companion to Hummingbird Salamander is a prior novel called Dead Astronauts. And there are two sentences from that I want to read uh, before I get to the passage. One uh, is from this kind of uh, blue fox who's like fighting off um, the worst of environmental damage and has been altered by humans so that it can actually have a human-like intelligence. And the fox at one point says to a human being, what a nothing he made of the world. And I think it's really important in terms of how we view our interactions with the world to realize just how much damage the modern modern society, modern world has done. Now, obviously, there are cultures and there are indigenous traditions that have been much, uh, much better about, about living in harmony and integration with the environment. But in terms of the modern world, we have inflicted a lot of damage. And it's important to acknowledge that and kind of like see that, you know, when you're just in your daily business going around looking for opportunities to to kind of change some of that damage. It, it, you have to be aware of it first. You have to know what it is you're looking at. Um, but the other flip side of that is that Fox at one point says, joy reminds us why we fight. And I think one thing that, that in terms of world building, in terms of literature and grappling with climate crisis is that we still have to find those moments of joy. We still have to remember the things that are important that we're fighting for and to be joyous about them and celebrate them uh, and celebrate the even the small victories uh, because, because otherwise, why, why are we even doing this? Um, this world is so miraculous. There are so many things to hold on to and, and to think about in that regard as well. So the Hummingbird Salamander novel excerpt I want to read, you know, this woman Jane is thrust into all of these kind of noirish mysteries around bioterrorism because this dead bioterrorist leaves her this strange taxidermy uh, as a clue. Uh, and she follows the clue <laughs> to all kinds of things she probably shouldn't. And one of them is Unitopia, which is this failed kind of environmental commune that Sylvina, the bioterrorist, bioterrorist uh, founded uh, as a more conventional means of kind of like grappling with the climate change. And so it has all these like museum-like qualities of like a nature center and trying to inform you about the environment. Uh, and it failed because it kind of got co-opted by consumerism and, and turned into the thing it was trying to protest. But at one point, um, there's a station in Unitopia in the, the, the museum area uh, that has uh, a bit of text that I think is kind of interesting and, and shows us how to maybe look at the world a little differently. So I walked up to the main placard, the standard welcome to Unitopia pablum, but next to it was another station where everything had been ripped out except a bit of wiring. The graphic showed sedimentary layers within the earth and the levels above ending in sky. I read part, then took a photo to remember it. What could be accomplished, it read, in understanding the miraculous in the everyday, if we could truly see the hidden underpinnings of the world, whether through immersive virtual reality or other method, whatever the process to that end, however you were changed or contaminated or released or mutated or entangled, Afterward, you'd walk down your street and everything would be identical to what you see with your own eyes, except you'd also see the chemical signals in the air from beetles and plants, pheromone trails laid down by ants, and every other bit of the natural world's communication invisible to our primitive five senses. You'd also see every trace of pesticide and runoff and carcinogens and other human-made intercessions on the landscape. It would be overwhelming at first. But once you got used to it, you'd look at the ground and it'd open up its layers past topsoil and earthworms down into the deeper epidermis, so to speak, until you're overcoming a sense of vertigo because even though you're standing right there, not falling at all, below you, everything is revealing itself to you super fast. And maybe then, while still staring at the ground, even more would open up to you, and you'd regress to the same spot five years, 10 years, 50 years, 200 years ago, 
until when you look up again, there's no street at all. And you're in the middle of a forest and there are more birds and animals than you could ever imagine because you've never seen that many in one place. You've never even seen this many old growth trees before. You've never known that the world was once like this, except in the abstract. And I got to thinking about this idea of the world as it was before, in part because of seeing movies that were set uh, like 300, 400 years in the past and realizing that they were showing the biodiversity of the present day in how they were shooting scenes in the wilderness. And when you look at accounts from, from back before the foundation of this nation, for example, you'll see ridiculous amounts of wildlife, like, like literally it would feel like moving through a city of animals rather than human beings just being out in the woods. Uh, and, and the fact that, and I think it's important to try to imagine that, to really understand that even when we're walking through very biodiverse places, that, that it may have been even more amazing uh, before. And so we, we, have to, we have to understand that and, and understand the way the world was once in order to possibly uh, get back to, to that again.